we all actually manage this situation hypermature supra hard cataracts and we all have been doing it day on, day in and day out i'll just kind of highlight uh, the situations which we really face and how i would like to tackle them so uh, basically the principles firstly the principles of management uh, we need a very good viscoelastic device and we need to choose a viscoelastic device like uh, according to the step we are managing uh, another principle is you know we need to manage the pupil beforehand because these hard supra hard cataracts very often present with small pupils or floppy iris syndromes so we need to manage that because that is the first thing uh, we need to check uh, unless we have a adequate pupillary dilatation the whole surgery becomes difficult and the third thing is the capsule management. We need to manage the capsule well. The capsular axis itself, uh, it's a, a very important part of the whole surgery. Unless that is well done, rest of the difficult surgery would be uh, more difficult to handle. And then is the nucleus management for the heart, supra heart cataracts. I'll start with, uh, with the first uh, video where uh, as you can see, I without a variant, uh, I externally I mark the rexis size because we need a very adequate uh, rexis. And after staining the capsule with trip and blue, uh, you can use any instrument, a cystitome to start with, and then uh, I use a macro rexis forceps. But it is upon you know it depends on the surgeon. It would vary with surgeon to surgeon. Anyone can use any instrument and uh, whatever is uh, suitable. But yes, a good viscoelastic is required uh, so that we have very good tamponade and uh, this rexis becomes easy. And we need to remember that an adequate size of rexis, a large good rexis is required. Now, uh, a gentle hydro dissection. Many times we may not need it, but mostly it is good to do a gentle hydro dissection. And then uh, we, what I generally do is I make multiple cracks from the periphery. Uh, these cataracts, it's difficult to reach the central posterior plate at one go. So once I do multiple cracks from the periphery, the central amorphous heart part of the nucleus is uh, it's delineated and this is the hardest core of the nucleus and this can be emulsified to make space in the within the center of the nucleus which really helps when we separate each piece and when we try to extend the cracks to the center of the in the uh, to extend to the center plate the hardest center plate now for this we need many techniques sometimes we do multi-level chopping once chopped, we go deep in our inside and then chop again so that we, the separation is well done. And each piece is separated and then we take one by one, emulsify them, and then we go ahead for uh, implantation of the IOL. So these are the basic principles that we need to use in these kind of cases. Now this is a situation where it's very often found that, uh, you know, very calcified thickly calcified anterior capsule now this calcified anterior capsule is really very difficult to uh, manage at times we have to cut it with the uh, small you know this uh, cystitome but it needs to be a controlled cut and many a times even this cystitome cannot cut the whole uh, calcified tissue uh, you can see i am struggling with these hard calcified areas and you cannot do much this is where i use a you know angled uh, micro scissor i have been trying with the cystitome nothing is happening so i am using this angled micro scissors and we cut it you can literally cut it so that it becomes uh, easy for us to continue doing the rexis so this is how you know special situations need special devices you need to cut them open with micro scissors and then you can continue with the rexis and maybe at times you use the rexis forceps to make a control pull once this is done once the rexis is done we know the strength of this rexis is not as good as our normal uh, continuous curvilinear rexis so we need to be very careful when we crack these nucleus not much of lateral separation can be done so we need to be careful in these situations now this is another situation where 
you can see it's kind of intumescent and after uh, we need to stain all these capsules because otherwise it becomes difficult and we start with a small rexis and enlarge it slightly bigger with a macro rexis forceps this is the standard uh, haldipurkar rexis forceps macro rexis forceps where you can really uh, have a good control to uh, enlarge the rexis so this and rest of the situation is fine this is a special situation where again uh, the whole cortex is liquefied and there is a central hard nucleus which is floating inside now uh, rexis itself it becomes difficult but after staining here again we start with a smaller rexis i'm using a rexis forceps and a smaller rexis to go with and then as you can see i'm slightly enlarging and here also there are calcifications in the uh, anterior capsule uh, and gradually i make it a bigger rexis now the problem with this uh, cataract is not just the rexis rexis is one problem but here as you can see when i try to impale the nucleus at the center for chopping the nucleus would start rotating and it's very wobbly and as you can see it will start rotating and it's very wobbly you really can't fix it so once and see it's rotating so uh, unless you can fix this nucleus you cannot crack it's very mobile so at some point of time we need to fix it first and then impale it in, in the center which is really difficult but uh, once we can do that we can create a crack the first crack is important and rest would follow so that is the biggest challenge we need to impale it in the center fix it and impale it in the center right now uh, this is the last situation i would like to discuss here again uh, what we can see is it looks like we can manage with this size of the people but it's a hard cataract but once i uh, you know stain the people size becomes smaller because of the turbulence of the bss and yes here uh, uh, i would like to use a malignant ring or any people expansion device and so that it becomes easy the next steps becomes easy uh, that is all sometimes we do use uh, iris hooks uh, whenever the uh, people is very rigid so uh, i'll because of lack of time i'll uh, cut till this part thank you so much if, can, if you have any stop the light all together because yeah. nothing is visible it's a sir i know it's sir it is clear, it's not possible because all the auditorium sir are about dimming about switching it off you cannot do it because you can switch off all the auditorium at a time not individual because auditorium this is a surgical based session it is absolutely useless showing this video i agree with yeah. you sir i agree with you bhai yeah, can we ye ye no no ek minute ये टीवी है वो पब्लिक की ओर कर सकते हो प्लीज उसका फेस वो बाजू कर सकते हो प्लीज डू इट टीवी को ऊपर लाके वो एक मिनट There's no point doing FECO here. So uh, SICS has been planned and uh, we'll go a little fast. and you can see here uh, before that i do little you know once i complete the wound uh, i make a side port and then of course we go ahead to tackle the vitreous first we do a vitrectomy anterior vitrectomy and then we with a wire vectis we take the lens out and as you can see it needs to be taken out in toto it's more or less a clear lens and once that is done uh, what we see here is a small uh, iododialysis at the 6 o'clock now this is yet another extreme situation whole back with the nucleus is there in the ac and uh, it's a spontaneous dislocation and it's not a traumatic one so these all are possible now in all these cases uh, you know when it's already there in the ac we take out with an wire vectis and 
for the iol selection uh, you know we used to do there are a lot of ways now uh, what we do here is uh, uh, glue diol and a glue diol uh, but we need to understand we need to do a very good vitrectomy whenever we are going posteriorly and uh, this is how it is done there are multiple methods of doing it pulling out the uh, you know leading haptic first with the macro forceps and then taking the other haptic out through the other uh, under the other flap the flap are pre-designed and of course uh, there are uh, small preformed channels there which uh, where the haptics are tucked and sometimes we use a ac maintainer to keep the ac formed while we implant the lens and take out the haptics and then the rest is uh, like we use fibrin glue or uh, we use glue to you know uh, after tucking the haptics we use glue to fix the flaps and the conjunctiva as well now this is how it is done well uh, this is another case where you know we uh, these retrofixation of uh, iris claw lens is also being used now very commonly these are handy except for you know in trauma where uh, trauma has badly damaged the iris or uh, you know the pupil uh, we don't use them uh, otherwise we can always use them it's easy simple method but vitrectomy has to be done and then uh, the pupils are to be uh, people should be tucked into the uh, claws so this is how it is done it's simple now this is another situation where you can see there's a small subluxation it's visible but there was no vitreous so sorry so what we did i started uh, doing you know the after a good rexis i did a little uh, you know hydro dissection and then i tried to i thought we should uh, put a ctr beforehand but it would have been done the other way around as well uh, after the cataract removal but uh, unfortunately all this has uh, made a lot of it has added to the trauma and there was vitreous in the ac even without staining it was very much uh, visible so anti vitrectomy was done and uh, once the vitreous settled uh, normal fake emulsification a slow motion fake emulsification is done and of course uh, lens is implanted uh, this is another short video i would like to show because uh, here you can see this is a traumatic subluxation a young man and uh, after uh, doing an adequate size rexis what uh, we do is you know a, na a normal hydro procedure i'll skip these uh, steps after removing the nucleus a soft soft nucleus i uh, implant a, a capsule tension ring where uh, and then after putting the lens i check with a uh, little uh, transcellular state and uh, with transcellular the vitreous is stained and uh, once vitrectomy is done anti vitrectomy is done we feel that we are secured but after the pupil is uh, made small with pilocarbon we see still vitreous is peeping out so that is where we go from behind so through the pars plana and then everything is cleared so it is always uh, better to go from pars plana to do a vitrectomy in this situation because even if, if we think that everything is fine uh, at the end of the surgery some vitreous may just come out through the people it can peak the people cause traction and later retinal detachment so it is better to go through the pars plana route and uh, clear up the vitreous there thank you okay this was another extreme situation but uh, because of uh, crunch of time i'll not uh, go into it but we need to all these situations we need to plan beforehand and uh, here again what we do is uh, we do vitre uh, vitrectomy lensectomy and uh, iris uh, you know uh, scleral fixation of iol not exactly it's a glued fixation and glued iol fixation and then repair of the uh, iododialysis which is which was a huge iododialysis there right so thank you thank you so much if you Thank are doing you, the operation under tropical yeah and you need to do pastrana yes do you give a uh, subtenon sub block yeah subtenon block can be given and uh, you know it's best to give a subtenon block because you know patient did not expect all this and there could be a lot of pain but uh, many uh, situations if the patient uh, you have to judge 
because this particular case I showed was a young man and he has tolerated on topical. It was a 27 gauge, uh, you know, vitrectomy. So he tolerated it very well. In fact, he didn't feel, he did not complain. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Shiddhattu. With that, may I invite Dr. Yogesh Shah for his talk on phacodynamic basics to advance. Giant. Sir will be presenting both the topics together. His second talk will be how do I select IOL in my practice. Sir, uh, Dr. Yokesh, uh, sir, just to answer to your uh, question, I mean, he has already clarified it. Alternatively, you can just dip your uh, Johnson bud in uh, paracaine and just put it over the conjunctiva where you want to uh, introduce your uh, side port or uh, whatever, I mean. Uh, and at that point, if you put a little drop of paracaine, it won't uh, make the cornea hazy because you are on a Johnson bud. Cordia will remain clear, anesthesia will be there, and you can go ahead and uh, in, uh, continue your vitrectomy pass plana. <coughs> okay, coming down to my topic, uh, there are two things. First of all, uh, the first topic is how do I select uh, IOL in my cataract practice? I have no financial interest. Now the first thing which uh, somehow or other I have seen and this is where I fortunately or unfortunately I do not know but I differ from the rest of the people in my life from day one I have never counseled never ever counseled anyone whether I am putting an Indian lens or I am putting an imported lens when my counselor counsels they never talk about Indian lens or imported lens even if the patient asks whether it is imported lens or an Indian lens, there are two answers which I normally give. My first answer, do you have a confidence in me? Have you come to me because of my confidence? If the patient says yes, then I say, I am going to use the lens which, in which I have my confidence and that settles. The second part is, you can always say that Indian lenses are exported to more than 80, 80 countries in the world today. And Indian lenses are much better than many of the imported lenses and that normally settles down the issue. Having said that, I understand that there are so many options uh, as listed over here. We need not go into the details of those. But when there are multiple choices available, it is very difficult to select what you should exactly do. And hence the first part in my practice is a detailed examination which is done by the optometrist before the patient comes to me on my table. And the most important thing which I normally tell them is to be very, very sure about the topographic evaluation so that I am 100% very sure about the value of cylinder and the axis of the cylinder beforehand because the, my first thing is the first factor to consider in past it used to be cutoff limit 1.25 today my cutoff limit is somewhere around 0.75 to 1 diopter if the cylindrical value is more than that then everything else is out straight away you start counseling the patient for toric IOL may it be toric plane monofocal or may it be toric multifocal but you need to go for the toric lens straight away and explain to the patient don't confuse him with too many things then. Straight away go and tell him that cylindrical value can only be corrected with this. Once you are sure that toric is not required, whether monofocal or multifocal lens, as I think uh, uh, previously somebody has already said in another uh, session possibly, if you can rule out the disadvantages of mono multifocal lens, then the first choice becomes multifocal in my practice. What are the disadvantages? One, demanding patient if you have. Second, excessive night driving, especially on the highway. And if the patient is not willing to undergo both the eyes together in a sequential way within a couple of days, then possibly you might straight away think about uh, uh, monomini vision or things like that. But otherwise, my choice today is a multifocal lens 
especially because the quality of vision which not which was not so good has now considerably improved number one we have edof eye oils we have modified trifocal lenses and we have such excellent lenses which can give us a good quality of both distant and near vision without compromising the quality of the vision to a large extent the accommodative lenses would be the next part but that is something which possibly is not existing as on today because uh, since we have other lenses which are very well available the accommodative lenses have probably fallen out of the stray the basic disadvantage of the accommodative lens is that the uh, the near vision which you get is only in the range of <coughs> approximately plus 1.5 to plus 2 diopter and that also gradually goes on reducing as the days go by and the patient eventually comes after a year or two without having much of a near vision benefit this is one thing which <coughs> i think uh, we really 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 need to consider most people have said you know the esphericity has been confused by the market to such a large extent that this is aspheric lens and i'm going to put aspheric lens it used to be about uh, 15 15 years ago i used to feel you know that uh, i have implanted in the first eye ordinary lens without asphericity and second eye when i did about 15 years ago i'm talking about telling the patient that this is going to give you a better acuity of vision and better quality of vision patient says my first eye is better than the second one primarily because we never understood the concept of asphericity we do know that uh, corneal asphericity has to be neutralized but you can over neutralize it like if you have corneal asphericity of plus 1 and instead of that if you have corrected to i'm sorry if as you can see it over here it i don't think it makes a difference anyway corneal asphericity is suppose plus 1 but you have chosen a lens of minus 1 uh, 2.8 asphericity then you are ending up with minus 1.8 asphericity and it is minus asphericity which is not so well tolerated by the patient even if you leave behind plus small amount of plus asphericity patient will be able to still tolerate that because that will be lead to lo loss of depth perception so if you are not very sure about it then go ahead and implant spherically aspherically neutral lenses we are correcting the zero asphericity as you can see it technis has got 2.8 correction alcon has 2.2 correction zeiss has probably uh, aspherically neutral lenses also the next part is material of the uh, i think there is not much of discussion as on today silicon lenses have fallen out of the stray even the fourth generation silicon oil lenses are also not really uh, required and not really appreciated by most people today we stick around with the hydrophobic or hydrophilic acrylic lenses the only problem was opacification of the lenses which is also getting corrected nowadays PMMA, yes, it does still uh, have a good role to play, especially when you are doing SICS surgery or something like that. PMMA lenses still work out uh, pretty well. 360 degree posterior surgical edge is a vital important thing to prevent the PCO. Most people say that uh, I have a posterior edge which is going to prevent, uh, uh, prevent the PCO postoperatively, but if that edge is not continuous where there is a optic haptic junction if it is not 360 degree then from there there is going to be penetration of the lens fibers going onto the posterior capsule and pco can develop so that is one thing which you need to uh, remember very well plate le haptic lenses are also fairly good somebody was uh, in the other hall i just heard in the morning it rotates but no it has got four point uh, fixation and even if in a myopic eye where white to white diameter is quite large when you are looking at the point of fixation that largeness is not there because it's not at the equator at 180 degree at 180 degree equator the distance will be much higher but where you are fixing it the distance is not that high and these uh, lenses in my opinion i have been putting a lot of plate haptic lenses they don't rotate even the toric plate haptic lenses they don't rotate much 
And finally, the most important thing, vital important thing in my opinion is the counseling. At no stage in our uh, practice, we have ever said that you will have 100% spectacle free vision. We keep on telling, hammering and hammering and hammering the patient that small final correction will be required. And there are large number of patients, if we really go to see it, like, you know, uh, there are plenty of uh, female gender patients coming. Their requirement is not night driving. Their requirements are not uh, that precision. They are not 100% uh, you know, uh, working throughout the day. But even if they can do a little bit on the, on the cell phone, on, on your mobile phone, and a little bit in the kitchen, they are extremely happy with the multifocal lenses. And that constitutes almost about 25% of my patients. So that's how the multifocality practice in my practice has uh, increased to a large extent. Thank you very much for your kind attention. I'll switch over to the next uh, topic. Any any question before that for Dr. Shah? Sure. No. Uh, Dr. Choudhury, Dr. in Bangladesh, how do you counsel? Because there is Indian lens and foreign lens, both are foreign to you. So how do you counsel your patients? Thank you very much for the question because that's very pertinent for Bangladesh. Inevitably, there have been the prior to us in the market and from the uh, other people, other patients, they are uh, aware of the fact that there are Indian lenses and there are uh, American lenses. They call it American lenses, uh, even though there are Hoya there, the Japanese ones are there, European ones are there. But I will admit that there is a tendency towards buying American lens. They feel comfortable, they feel confident about the American lenses. Um, if they can afford it, it's quite high in Bangladesh, I don't know about India. So if I can afford it, um, it's, it's, I think it's regrettable that they tend to choose American lens uh, and they go for uh, the, we do have a lot of patients opting for Indian lenses. Uh, because we counsel them equally. And because the lenses we know, they're so good from India, and we do tell them that they work equally good. So, but the tendency is the ultimate decision with the patient uh, lies with the patient, and it usually is the economics that drives the decision. Thank you. Precisely, so ma'am, but uh, in that also, in every category, I have two or three packages. It's not single package. But it doesn't go with, uh, you know, Indian or imported. It goes with the functioning capacity of that particular lens, like s city like Toricity, like, uh, you know, uh, my confidence in that yeah, particular but lens. There is a lot of price difference. So Correct. So whatever the, I give three packages. I'm just giving you an example. Suppose I have a basic package, which anybody would want, especially when they have a, uh, uh, they have an insurance, uh, cover with them. 25,000 is something which is being normally given by insurance company to everyone. So you start your package with 25 as the lowest one. And higher one, you can take it up to one and a half lakh. Who prevents you? You need to know what, suppose the patient is able to pay a little more, you don't count him, counsel him about 25,000 altogether. That's an art of counseling. And that's what we try and normally practice. We don't give them one package. We give them three packages in the same category. So what is the minimum for the patient those who don't have insurance? Uh, my, in my practice, we have not gone beyond uh, 25. But uh, I think uh, it's a surgeon's choice. And it depends upon in which area you are practicing, what is the surrounding people charging uh, in your locality. A lot of things go on. If you really look at uh, your cost, for an Indian lens and whatever consumable you are spending, even if you do 10,000 rupees cataract surgery, you still save some amount of money. Thank you, sir. So we'll invite you for your next talk, back to sure. back talk. Please set the timer, sir. Sir, please set the timer to seven minutes. No, just one second, just one second. I'm sorry? Apart from Albert's lens, uh, basically, uh, alcohol toric lenses uh, probably is the most uh, used toric lens in my practice. Uh, 
Yes, sir. But when, uh, as I just said that I normally have two or three my package is not one package and the person who wants to go for a lower toric uh, I mean lower package I have used uh, at times uh, either care group or uh, Apaswami toric lenses but and they are reasonably they are reasonably good reasonably they are reasonably good. good and one more question sir how do you rate uh, Edof lenses in comparison to uh, these lenses uh, multifocal lenses Edof lenses are also uh, good, but something like iHands, which has come up recently, which gives excellent uh, intermediate range. Mm -hmm. uh, of late, of late in last maybe uh, a year or so, I have been trying to mix and match. I have used a normal multifocal lens, and now if I have achieved the near vision fairly well and I want a good quality of vision, then in the next eye I go for iHands. Thank you, sir. Well, anyway, my second talk, uh, unfortunately, is this is a this is too long a topic for me. I normally speak for about uh, 45 minutes, one hour. I'll try to cover up as fast as I can. No financial interest. Now, basically, we need to understand that there are two systems. The first is a peristaltic system. The second one is a venturi system. When we are talking about a peristaltic system, here the pump rotates. And as the pump rotates, it takes a column of fluid between the two rotating balls and it tries to take the fluid out of the eye, out of the anterior chamber. And that's how when we go in the further slides, I would demonstrate that this removal of the aqueous from the eye, from the anterior chamber, what we call aspiration, is an active process. Unless and until there are other mechanisms which have now come up where we say there is active fluidics, where, uh, where input of the aqueous is also an active process. But in a venturi system, it's altogether a different entity. There is a flow of air in one line, a rapid flow of air, and that line is corrected with the cassette. And when you have that line connected with the cassette, as you can see it over here, some amount of air is also dragged by the flow of air from the cassette thus generating a negative pressure within the cassette and when there is a negative pressure it allows the fluid to come in and that's how the occlusion is not required in a venturi system to develop the vacuum having understood this these are the various things on which i will talk as i just said aspiration is an active process but you need to remember that the aspiration rate is the amount of fluid which is going out of the FACO tip. You don't have to consider the thing which is due to the leakage and other things. This is a basic thing which you will have to set up in a, in a peristaltic system. In a venturi system, aspiration is not required to be set into the parameter. It is the aspiration which is going to drag the nuclear pieces towards the FACO tip and that is how it is going to make the entire FACO emulsification more and more easy right remaining in the central area without going to the periphery in the eye. Irrigation I said is not an active, it's only basically the difference in the hydrostatic pressure between the bottle height and the hydrostatic pressure in the anterior chamber that you are generating after the aspiration. More the bottle height, more will be the hydrostatic pressure. But you can make it somewhat more, uh, the um, uh, irrigation can be improved by either using the SEM or multiple things have been tried in past like a fish pump or uh, tying up uh, a BP cuff around the plastic irrigation bottle and things like that. But in normal new, newer machines like Centurion and all that, it is already kind of measured thing, monitored thing where you can work with a set intraocular pressure which you want, which the surgeon wants during the surgery. Vacuum is a negative pressure created in the aspiration tubing. When the negative pressure is created in the aspiration tubing and the nuclear piece is at the, attached to the tip of the FACO machine, nothing is going in and the nuclear piece remains 
struck down or attached to the FACO tip so that you can emulsify it. It can be either prefixed, it can be prefixed linear, it can be dual linear. It is a dual linear which I would like to describe a little more in detail time permitting. Power, uh, I think uh, I will skip this power part and all that because most of us know that you have ozil, you have uh, uh, elliptical power and so on and so forth. Followability, uh, just now Siddharth I think demonstrated uh, the rupture of uh, posterior capsule. Remember, if there was a good followability initially and if the followability is lost, it indicates there is some complication somewhere most likely you are dealing with PCR. Followability will allow you to remain in the center of the eye and all the uh, nuclear pieces will come to your FACO tip. You don't have to run after the nuclear piece. The nuclear piece will automatically come to the FACO tip. Surge is one of the most important thing which you need to remember. It's a sudden collapse of the anterior chamber and when that comes, either the endothelium of the cornea can get compromised or the PCR can occur. To remember that the surge has to be prevented, there are multiple mechanisms available to us which, uh, which will help us to prevent the surge. But before we go to that, let me explain this part of the fluidics, what exactly happens. If you look at a peristaltic system, the first thing that will happen is the occlusion of the FACO tip. When the FACO tip is occluded by a nuclear piece, no amount of the fluid can go into the FACO tip or the, in the aspiration tubing. However, at that point of time, the pump continues to rotate. As the pump is rotating, the fluid is being dragged out of the aspiration tubing. Nothing is coming in the aspiration tubing but the fluid is going out of the aspiration tubing and hence the negative pressure will be created in the aspiration tubing. But at that point of time, the irrigation will continue because the irrigation has nothing to do with the pressure in the aspiration tubing. It has got everything to do with what is the pressure in the anterior chamber. So long as there is a hydrostatic difference between the pressure in the anterior chamber and the pressure due to the bottle height, the fluid will go into the anterior chamber. Thus, you are ending up with a situation, moment there is occlusion, into a situation where there is a lot of pressure in the anterior chamber, which is equivalent to hydro hydrostatic pressure of the bottle height and a negative pressure in the aspiration tubing. So, moment the occlusion breaks, there is a sudden gush of uh, fluid. My time? Yeah, okay, sir. Uh, I think I will skip the uh, rest of it and I'll just, if allowed, uh, I'll, can I just show the dual linear which is very close to my heart. So there will be a gush of fluid and that is the surge. Surge can be prevented by many things which uh, we will not go into the detail. I just would like to, now look at this particular thing. I hope uh, the yes, pointer is working. I, I'm basically very fond of a dual linear foot pedal over here. As you can see, the FACO tip is attached and I have, by your, by your movement over here, I generated a power which embedded the FACO tip into the nuclear piece. Now that I have got a FACO tip attached to the nucleus, I pull it so that the whole piece comes a little bit towards the center, giving me a space for my chopper to go into the periphery and chop the thing. Once I chop, at that point of time, I lift up my foot pedal to reduce the amount of vacuum. Now I am holding the tip, but at the same time, I want to eat it up also. So I need to give the energy. To give the energy, I again move yo, and as you can see it, the energy is coming up to 22. Moment the energy has come, the uh, nuclear piece is getting eaten up, and at that point of time, I lift up my foot to the zero position. So everything is online controlled by the patient, by the surgeon. There is no need for going anywhere else. You can preset whatever you want, whatever, and that all happens in a linear fashion. I'm not sure how many of you are using dual linear foot pedal. I have been using dual linear foot pedal almost for about 20 years with my Millennium machine, which I had initially, and I'm extremely happy. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Yeah, dual linear control, this very good control I have used for 10 years, uh, Stores Millennium. So is it available in the newer generation? Uh, yeah, yeah, many. Bosch machine is available, no? Uh, 
yes it is available in many of the machines even zeiss uh, uh, that uh, ec 500 or whatever they call that also but remember one thing in some of the dual machines which give dual linear on the yo you can only and only increase the vacuum Not you cannot you cannot increase the power however millennium or, you can yeah. yes you the can adjust the thing for the juniors there are machines where you can use both um, venturi and uh, the peristaltic so if you have that option how will you shift in which stage of fake will shift to venturi and which stage of fake will stay with peristaltic a uh, very good question sir but once again let me uh, assure you that since i started my practice with millennium i was more used to venturi system right from day one i was more used to venturi system and not the peristaltic system i have both like uh, kalzai's machine gives you both peristaltic as well as venturi system i still go on with the peristaltic system in zeiss machine because it is now very efficient previously the venturi was very very efficient system compared to the compared to the peristaltic and especially when we are dealing with a very hard cataract it is a venturi power which uh, by which gives you a, the only thing which you need to remember is i just said that in venturi system there is some amount of vacuum in spite of having no occlusion that is something which you need to keep in mind the occlusion comes in peristaltic system i mean vacuum start building up in peristaltic system only and only after the occlusion has occurred thank you sir for your feedback thank you, thank you very much devash is that you want to invite the next speaker okay so we are inviting dr parvez uh, the young surgeon from calcutta and he will be speaking on uh, where is it gone tori kaiwel the basic strip yes mozam parvez from rio calcutta where can i see the timer Sorry. Where can I see the timer? What the timer? Timer uh, seven minutes. Okay. Now. All right. All right. I'll, I'll let you know. At okay. six minutes, I'll let you know. Okay. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm here to uh, share my first few cases of Tori Kaiwel. So I would like to start my presentation by quoting uh, Dr. Abhay Vaswara sir that as advances in technology and techniques continue to erode the boundaries between the refractive and cataract surgeries, emmetropia has gone from an exceptional result to an expected outcome. The basics: uh, a lens whose cylindrical surface is curved in both the horizontal and the vertical meridians is called a toric lens. The principal meridian of minimum curvature is called the base curve. Each meridian of curvature forms a separate line focus. The distance between these lines is called the interval of Sturm, and the spherical equivalent is calculated by adding the spherical power and half of the cylindrical power. Uh, before choosing my cases for toric, I would like to avoid patients with ocular pathology, a small pupil, and progressive retinal problems. I would like to do biometry for both the eyes and a scan immersion or optical biometry with a good graph. uh kemetry with axis and the latest generation formula for baric uh, we use the baric toric calculator which is uh, available on the apa crs website uh, where we enter the steep and uh, steep axis uh, axial length and anterior ch chamber depth to get the readings where we get the uh, angle at which we will align the diamond markers the mantra for doing the toric would be mark remark implant and align so for the pre op marking we would align the patient uh, eye level with ours uh, that would be done by uh, making the patient sit on the ot table and uh, escalating it to bring it to our uh, level place a speculum dip the bubble marker in trypan blue dye and align the bubble in the middle compartment and uh, mark the 090 and 180 on the limbal area of the patient this is the mendes ring in the center which is uh, used for intraoperative marking and on the left side we have the axis marker uh, this is a intra intraoperative snippet of uh, the mendes ring placed on the limbus and uh, 
the corresponding uh, markings are correlated. So here is a video, if it's visible. So the first thing we would do, we would dry tap the uh, markings, the cardinal markings. Once done, we would uh, start with the intraoperative marking, which would involve placing the Mendes ring on the limbal area. Uh, over here, I use a Sinsky uh, hook to do the final marking. In this case, as you can see, it's between 0 and 5 degrees. It is repeated on the other side as well. Once confident about the markings, we move ahead with a normal phaco emulsification surgery. From here, we take a clear corneal incision made at 1 o'clock. The Rex is a, a curvilinear, central, well-centered 5 to 5.5 millimeter Rex is very important, which would uh, facilitate uh, the IOL to be placed properly inside the bag and avoid decentration in the long term. As well-centered as possible, the Rex is. Moving ahead with further steps, a conventional trench and chop is done to do the nuclear management. In this case, which would be followed by quad mode and now a cautious cortical cleaning is done, quadrant by quadrant in uh, by manual irrigation aspiration, where the asp irrigation is kept stable and the aspiration probe goes in the different quadrants and does cortical cleaning. The cortical cleaning uh, should be done avoiding any kind of PCR which would further stop us from placing a toric IOL in this particular case. We also need to be very careful about avoiding intraoperative meiosis uh, which would hinder now the rotational stability, as you can see the diamond markers. The diamond markers are placed at the optic haptic junction. The lens is placed in the cartridge and uh, further pushed down the nozzle, making sure that the haptic does not get caught somewhere and the movement is mobile and free. Now under OVD, the lens is being implanted in the bag uh, making sure that the leading haptic lands inside the bag so that the dialing becomes easier in the next steps. The unfolding system of this multifocal toric lens is quite slow, so we use a ball dialer Sinsky hook to dial the trailing haptic inside the bag and the lens is tried to be placed as gently as possible and the optic is being centered. Once the optic is centered, we will, the IOL is placed before one clock hour so that the IOL dialing is as easy as possible inside the bag. Once done, we will start eating up the OVD, meticulous OVD aspiration is done again in a bimanual irrigation aspiration mode. We will go behind the lens, tap the lens, and take out all the OVD as much as possible before going for the final redialing, uh, final dialing of the lens. Time. We would uh, visco cleaning behind the lens, gentle tapping, and hydration would complete my case where. I would see the alignment, as you can see here, the, sorry. The diamond markers are visible and uh, post-op uh, dilated IOL position is marked with the marking and the diamond markers. Thank you, Parviz. Have you finished? No, your no? I'm not done, it's stuck somewhere. Oh. 
I'm left with three slides. Your time is up, so if you can okay. summarize while it's getting ready. Okay. All right. So in the meantime, I'll ask uh, Dr. Parag, Parag Mukherjee, you do a lot of SICS surgery, high volume. Is there any place of toric IVL in your surgical practice of SICS? What percentage of cases uh, do you do toric IVL in SICS? Not, not many. Not many. When I find a gross cylindrical disorder, then I, I use. Dr. Shah, any input for the junior surgeon here? Parvez is working very hard in Calcutta. Any input? So, well, I think uh, probably he may have shown also because we because of the shortage of time. Yes. The last part which I would like to emphasize is that uh, uh, I often try to use uh, helon-like substance uh, while introducing the lens rather than uh, methyl cellulose. The reason is it's easy to remove it, number one. Number two, uh, I invariably block the main port and the second side port before I remove my irrigation uh, tubing. Mm -hmm. Irrigation tubing I, is the last one to be removed because moment you don't do that and you there remove it, there is a collapse, slight collapse of the chamber and that also can or invariably lead to the little bit of a rotation of the toric lens. Dr. So, Yasin sir, any, any input? Uh, I think removing uh, OVD from the back of the lens is something very important. Yes sir. Because otherwise, there is a possibility of rotation of the lens. Post and as you said, we must ensure that the chamber postoperatively does not become shallow and again uh, means uh, fluctuate. That is important. So, I have one observation, Parvez. You are doing the IA through the main port by manual. That actually make your chamber unstable and you can easily catch the posterior capsule in a, if it is a lax posterior capsule. If you are using bimanual, it's better to use two hands from the side port rather than going through the main port. You, mm, that's one thing. Other thing which you can do, if you can do under irrigation, in, uh, I will placement, or you can place the haptic, the trailing haptic over the bag. It, it becomes very easy to remove the OVD from behind the lens and better to use helon or similar as sir has suggested because it can be removed as a bolus rather than hypromellose and then just tuck the caps uh, trailing haptic inside the back it's very easy if you can practice it's very easy okay sir. okay thank you and suppose if uh, the alignment is not proper what will happen how the toricity will be uh, not Awesome. Uh, for every one degree, 3.3 percent of cylindrical power loss will be there, and uh, after 30 degree, they will the lens will lose its astigmatic correction. Is there any probability of uh, um, increasing the astigmatism if it is rotated more? More than 30 degree, is, the sir, lens. Uh, will, what is your yeah. experience? Is there any? Yeah, I mean, as he said that if you go beyond 30 degree, yeah. but I'll give you one uh, incidence. Uh, uh, a doctor friend of mine from another city one day rang me up and he said that I implanted a toric lens. The previous pre-op astigmatism was about uh, two diopter. And then at the end of it, when I realized it went to four diopter, everything was normal. My surgery was perfect. My, I had done a absolutely proper uh, uh, um, uh, alignment of the lens and everything. How did I get four diopter? Was the lens wrong? Was it uh, that the company has given me a long lens? So simple thing, I asked him, what axis did you consider? Was it on a topographic this thing or was it on your uh, um, uh, keratometer? He took a keratometric value. Remember, keratometric value gives on a minus cylindrical uh, component. And toric lenses are on the plus cylindrical component. So it is exactly opposite. That's how his astigmatism got doubled up. So we should be very uh, clear about alignment. Yes, very you clear. need to know the, exactly what if is there the... there is any misalignment, there is a website called astigmatismfix.com. It's free. You can put the data in and it will show how much to rotate. You have to take the patient back to the OT and rotate the IVL. Thank you. Okay, thank you.
No, in keratoconus, uh, it should not be done. Early, even early is not not stable. Not stable. When not, it, yeah. it preferably should not be done. Thank you, Dr. Mawazam. Yes. With that, may we invite Dr. Shugato Paul with his topic, Mishap with the candula. Shugato. So, it's actually Mishap with my pen drive, so they couldn't open the pen drive, so I have downloaded the video, and it's uh, two videos, actually. Please move it to 15 seconds. So it's, uh, yeah, so stop there. So, just one second. This is a separate video where I am rotating a lens on the PCR. I did tell you to set it at 15 seconds. Where is it? Okay, yeah, so here is a case straightforward case where I'm in after the section I'm injecting a timer seven yeah, uh, injecting OVD and just keep and watch the OVD is going in and the cannula went in it just came out of the liver luke cannula liver luke didn't function it just went in and you can see it's hitting the capsule very hard so what will you do next Are so main point here i think is to assess how much damage it has done quite often it can hit the angle can cause high femur quite often it can uh, hit the capsule and uh, uh, cause a uh, tear in the capsule so um, uh, that's what it happened and you can see the cannula is a leolic cannula where you can lock the cannula in spite of that probably the nurse didn't lock it properly but luckily I do as a habit keep my finger at the end of the cannula so it didn't go that hard. So then I switched on the Lumera eye retroillumination and I could make out that capsule has run out there. So what is not playing? So what can we do next? So there are options of in this situation what you can do first decide whether to convert to FECO or uh, sorry stay with FECO or to convert to SICS and it depends on the surgical acumen or the confidence of the surgeon and here I decided to go ahead with the FECO. So the first thing you have to do is to get good access to the nucleus. So I did give a cut to the extension with the Vana scissor and then got a good extension now hydro dissection hydro dissection should be minimal so that it doesn't extend the uh, to the posterior capsule and rotation of the nucleus is better to use as you can see i'm using two chopper sharp chopper so that no force during rotation with single chopper or single dialer no force is put on the zonule so i'm using two choppers to rotate the nucleus gently next is your working area of the FECO. As you can see, my uh, extension was here. So I've directed my FECO tip almost perpendicular to the extension. So that again, to minimize force on the extended area. So this is one point you have to remember and you have to be very gentle. The one thing you can do actually is to do anterior planar FECO by moving the nucleus out of the back but here i decided to stick in to the uh, posterior chamber feco so first chop is done and again if you can see while rotating i am rotating with the help of the feco tip i am using as a hinge and i am rotating with the dialer so that again no pressure is put on the zonul so now once the nucleus is rotated i am getting a second chop done and then again rotate i'm hinging on the feco tip and rotating with the nuclear uh, with the chopper very gently and i'm getting another chop so two pizza pie once two smaller pizza pie is done then you can take out the nucleus and you can do other uh, uh, you can do chops of the other uh, half of the nucleus and can gradually take it out so then it becomes easy again at this stage you have to look for with sign whether there is 
fluttering of the anterior uh, uh, capsule extension. So you have to remember if there is fluttering, chances of the wrap-up tear is not there. But if the fluttering has uh, stopped, then the chance of wrap-up tear is there. Then you have to think of your second option of converting or bringing the uh, nucleus into the anterior chamber. So once this is done, the next point you have to remember, don't take out your phaco tip suddenly. Fill in with the visco. The chamber is formed. No chance of extension. Then you take out the phaco tip. And same thing you have to do while doing IA as well. While doing IA, you have to be careful not holding the extension of the capsule. Gently pull in the center. Now regarding the lens choice, time up. Uh, regarding the lens choice, three options are there. One, one second. One is three-piece eyewell, which was not available at that time. Second is single-piece hydrophilic. Third is single-piece hydrophobic. Now, don't put a three-piece eyewell in the bag in this situation because the haptic will find way and go out to the extension. So if you are putting three-piece eyewell, put it on the sulcus. But if you are putting single piece I will try to put it in the back remnant of the back which I have done and then I have used uh, uh, pilocarpin to uh, make this pupil small, small and see that the pupil is round and finishing the case. Thank you very much. Any discussion on the topic please? Any question? With your excellent skill you passed your 10 minutes with all the apprehensions and with your strategies. But what message you are saying to common average skill surgeons? Eh? I am an average skill surgeon, sir. If we follow the techniques, like like not doing the FECO where it's extended, not rotating the nucleus heart where the zonule is pressed with, with the two tip I'm rotating, so no pressure is on the zonule. And then you have the scope of bringing the capsule uh, the nucleus up in the anterior chamber. And third thing, you have to get rid of the ego if required, convert to SICS. I think one important thing which we have noticed in his surgery, the lateral separation was minimal. Just to get the space, just to get the crack. Because if you try to make a lat lateral separation quite a bit, then it, there are chances that that tear will extend. Otherwise, uh, you know, uh, minimum stretch on the zonules, what he is trying to emphasize, also means that lateral separation should also be just adequate to get the two house separated. So, do you reduce the settings as well as by doing the experiment? Honestly, no. So do you in the same settings? Sir? Yes. So uh, was it the pressure was swing? I, normally, nowadays, I use, I start fake with 20. Um, uh, pressure uh, IOP sometimes goes up to 32 depending upon the chamber stability otherwise uh, no I don't change not even the bottle heights, no uh, while doing the nuclear management yes you, were you doing it in the bag or in the yes, it was in the bag that's uh, because the sometimes yeah. you know doing it is like yeah you can that's another second option is you can it is safer, it in the chamber. safer it was a hard nucleus so i thought i'll change stay in the chamber and if required i can bring it up. put more pressure on the capsule bag yeah that's why i'm rotating as you have as i've shown i'm rotating with two hooks and also while rotating while during the feco i'm hinging with the feco tip and rotating against that so i'm not putting any pressure on the zonules that is a very good technique. That is yeah. a very good technique. Sorry? Do you take it uh, Yeah, I, I did show you that. I did uh, cut with the venous scissor and then did the hemorrhages. I did show it. But what about that uh, notch is always there. That is, notch that is, is there. open. That is open. Unless and until your tear was not beyond 6 millimeter uh, yeah. in the radius portion. Then you can probably circumvent that and yeah. then it will be uniform. But it otherwise. It was on the equator, so that was open. Yeah. Thank you, sir. So, yeah, who is the next presenter, Dr. David? Thank you so much, Shugato. With that, we come over to the tips for cataract surgery in a diabetic patient. Uh, thank you very much, uh, the scientific committee, for giving me this opportunity. Uh, Diabetes has become, you know, our Indian country has become the diabetic capital of the world now. And we, so as eye surgeons, we often come across 
uh, a considerable number of patients who are diabetics. So as we all know that diabetics are two to five times more likely to develop cataract and they form early and they can be different morphological types. But so now the consensus according to the studies that early surgery is being recommended because before the lens opacities are obscuring the retinal details and uh, for preventing retinal evaluation and timely surgery, timely treatment. So according to the ETDRS, diabetic retinopathy progresses and visual acuity worsens about 20 to 50 percent of the uh, cases after uncomplicated cataract surgery compared to the fellow unoperated eye. So we have to be very, very careful about this. So we need to do a preoperative counseling, which is very, very important to the patient about the expectation of visual outcome in such cases. And it's so important to have a good glycemic control and control of ocular and periocular infection because the conjunctiva in diabetics are more prone to having uh, staph aureus, and streptococcus, clepsiella, other infections. So it will be very, very thorough asepsis is important, preoperatively thorough ocular examination. And uh, sometimes FFA, if it's an active diabetic endopathy, fluorescent angiography helps you know to assess the situation. OCT of the macula is very, very important in all cases of diabetic endopathy. B scan ultrasonography, when we can't uh, get to see the uh, retina, uh, it is helpful to do a B scan retin uh, ultrasonography. And in such cases, often uh, one school of thought is also to use preoperative topical NSID about starting about a week before the cataract surgery. So if, we, if the patient is having pre-existing DME, so previously we used to do focal and grid laser, but that is becoming less uh, you know, popular nowadays. And pharmacotherapy is a very, very important uh, you know, modality of treatment. Perioperative intravitreal anti of injection, and sometimes you know, intravitreal steroid injection can also be given. And intraoperative, it has been studied, studies have shown that intraoperative pranibizumab is the most effective of all the anti uh, of drugs uh, in practice. And intraoperative steroid injection can be reserved for those persistent and refractory DME cases, where, but we have to remember about the risk of increased IOP, which can be very high and devastating. A patient coming with PDR which is untreated coming for cataract surgery, it definitely progresses after cataract surgery. So we have to go for a, if, we poss if possible, a PRP preoperatively. And if the view is not that good, indirect laser photocoagulation PRP can be done within a week's time after the cataract surgery. And combined cataract surgery and vitrectomy can be taken up in case there is a vitreous hemorrhage or a fractional return detachment of the macula. So, uh, and a patient, ha sometimes, you know, we can also get a patient having neovascular of the iris or the neovascular glaucoma. And we have to remember the prognosis is not that good in such cases. And, but we have to anyhow go for a prompt treatment and control the inflammation and the intraocular pressure medically. And then, you know, inject intravitreal anti vegf injection and then go for the phacal muscle surgery. And sometimes uh, with vitectomy and uh, if the already if the angle is closed with fibrosed new vessels, then we have to go for trabeculectomy and fibromyalgia combined surgery. Uh, what is what sort of IULs we should choose in such cases? A large diameter IUL for better visualization of the peripheral retina, and often in these cases they often develop severe PCO, and there's a chance of capsular phimosis, anterior phimosis. So we have to be careful about that. We should make a larger axis. Hydrophobic acrylic IOL is the most preferred IOL. Uh, we can get though mild antechamber flare in the early post-op period. Blue light filtering IOLs are very good for such cases. Multifocal IOLs are absolutely no-no. And silicon lenses, as mentioned, we are not using anymore. And iris claw lenses to be avoided because it leads to poor mydriasis and in chance of cystoid macroedema. So intraoperatively, we should go for a phaco mastification IOL surgery and larger capsulosis, as I mentioned, longer duration and complicated, more complicated cataracts should be avoided because it increases the risk of diabetic retinopathy progression. And poor pupillary dilatation should be managed with iris hooks and malignant ring, BX ring. Intraoperative hyphema can also happen due to neovascularization of the iris. 
photograph nubati can take place and this these eyes have a very you know abnormal corneal epithelium so they can lead to corneal epithelial defects delayed healing of the epithelium and endothelial cell loss is also important thing to you know take care of specular microscopy helps to assess the uh, endothelial layer and endothelial protection with the uh, visco device is very very important so challenges that we face are sometimes vitreous hemorrhage obscures the red reflex which capsulitis is because more difficult brunesen and white cataracts use of trypan blue is very important post vitrectomy cataract is commonly encountered uh, patients who had already had a vitrectomy done so we have to be very careful in these cases uh, a rapidly developing white cataract after vitrectomy is leads to, you know gives a clue that the poster capsule is compromised so you should be cautiously doing the hydro resection zonular laxity is another problem in such cases and increased floppiness of the capsule is seen in vitrectomized eyes so you should be careful in this in center involving dme we have to give intravitreal and uh, antivirus injection and repeat injections uh, as per the drcr uh, recommendations steroids can be also given in persistent uh, refractory dme cases so it is better to give it intraoperatively so post of consideration we should De definitely look at the NP in NPDR cases. We should follow them up, and after three months' time, we should check the patient up. PDR should be closely followed up, and as I said, cornea uh, can uh, heal a, a little delayed, you know. And post-op EVI should be controlled, and NVI should be looked for. Prompt treatment of that should be done. Increased risk of endothelitis is always kept in mind, and uh, FFA uh, should be can be take, uh, done to. Uh, distinguish CMO. So, in general, mild NPDR, no DR uh, cases are they give good results. Moderate to severe, the increased risk of progression is there. Advanced DR, sometimes in, even after cataract surgery, we may not be getting a good visual outcome. The so visual recovery depends upon the macular status. How is the perfusion? Whether this is a DME, ERM stage of the diabetic endopathy. Can you sir, sum up, please? If you can so, sum up, please. So, and vitrectomy cases can be combined with uh, cataract surgery in case coexistent cataract, non clearing vitreous hemorrhage, macular TRD, combined RD, and persistent DME. So, in to conclude, diabetic patients are a unique subset of patients. They have to be, uh, surgeons need to be aware of the difficulties and challenges uh, during the operation, cataract su surgery, and we have to optimize the retinal condition first before going for the cataract surgery. And modern minimal incision cataract surgery is the treatment of choice, modality of cho uh, choice, and pharmacological th therapies, they play a very uh, safer and more effective role in such cases. And as I mentioned, patient education and counseling is very, very important. We all invite you to Calcutta next year for the AIOC. Thank you. Thank you. For shortage of time, I think we'll go on to the next talk because we have to leave the hall in time and there will be a lot of discussion with Dr. Chaudhary, Dr. Das there, if we have time. So Devashis, if you can invite our next speaker. Yeah. It is not in the list, sir. Oh, so in our next speaker is Dr. Shushrut Pandit Anand from Jamshadpur. He will be speaking on how to recycle contact lenses to make it environmental friendly, I yeah. believe. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my topic is a little bit alien in this group, actually. <laughs> Uh, I don't know why it was put in this room. Uh, uh, I would like to thank AOS for giving me this opportunity, as well as my wife, Dr. Priyanka, who has helped me a lot in doing this project. Uh, I would be speaking on building responsible organizations uh, by doing recycling of contact lenses. I have no financial interest. Coming to the introduction, uh, social responsibility is a very important to us as hospital and helping to protect our environment is a part of that. For years, contact lens wearers have struggled to find ways in which to dispose the lenses ethically without resorting to sending them to the landfill. landfill. Reducing plastic waste is high on the agenda and we are really pleased that we are working on proper method to recycle contact lenses. Being the owner of the Anand Eye and Mother Care, I'm happy to prote uh, protect the environment by researching on contact lens recycling scheme, as it will be bring into practice method to divert the waste into landfill sites. What we need to know is that even if we make an effort to recycle contact lenses and packaging in standard recycle bins, they can get filtered out due to their small size, contributing to landfill waste across the country. 
what is the uh, uh, contact lenses in india actually contact lenses continue to register strong value around um, growth since 2016 due to the rising popularity of these products among urban consumers the increasing availability of contact lenses in indian market due to the growth in branded retail outlets and outlet retailing also helped both uh, boost the growth the estimated lens use each year is around 40 lakhs this accounts to 40 lakhs into 3 grams of uh, contact lenses coming out to be 12000 plastics annually what is the problem statement the used contact lenses are prevalent in wastewater sludge after sewage treatment The problem is that since sludge is often deposited on land, those lenses can eventually wash off into lakes and rivers, where fishes, birds, and other animals can consume them. We cannot ask people to stop wearing contact lenses. So many people are dependent on them. Daily disposable ones, and rather the ones people wear for a week or more, are the one that is fastest growing part of contact lens market and more are more convenient and safe. So the better option is to encourage proper disposal of the lenses. Bosch and Lomb has partnered with a company called TerraCycle that specializes in, in recycling smaller items that wouldn't normally get separated into the uh, in the standard process. Researchers have found out that this company that is seriously per seriously pursuing contact lens recycling program. Thus, in India also, we should start such recycling methods. Disposing lenses into waste containers, sinks, and toilets can create plastic waste as they can uh, they are, as they are made. of tough plastic which don't break down fully when exposed to microbes now a little bit of chemistry of the contact lenses i'll skip this uh, what is the environmental impact on flushing of contact lenses every year indians flush over millions of contact lenses down the drain researchers found that these lenses are not do not effectively break down in the lab simulations of water treatment facilities around half of the treated water and whatever else in it ends in getting dumped into the soil treatment meaning anywhere around 11000 to 12650 kilograms of contact lens fragments end up into the country dirt annually contact lens fragments can impact the soil potentially shattering into small pieces where these microplastics could enter the food chain lenses are absorbent taking in toxins from the surrounding dirt also how many end up in the oceans and the waterways couldn't be determined thus entering into fishes and other animals which can be very hazardous and dangerous for their lives a little bit uh, contact lenses are generally of two types pmma and the soft hydrogel lenses this is the molding as well as the lathing process of this of making of the contact lens the execution of the plant the pl execution of the plant at our center the, the recycling has two uh, economy actually linear and circular in linear economy we take the company takes the product makes it we consume it and we throw it away but that is not good we should go for the circular uh, economy that reduces reuses and recycles the products now what is the analysis we started a survey a month before the covid and the we now yeah in our uh, center but due to covid restrictions we could not continue with this thus if we, uh, hypothesis is that thus we if we uh, see that if we in one month we dispose around 20 lenses which might have flushed down into the drain as well as in the rivers and consumed by the animals Uh, execution of the plan in collaboration with the Stera Cycle. Patients purchasing are concerned to uh, uh, about the reg uh, regards hazard of hazards and proper dis disposable and told about the benefits of recycling of the lenses. Their addresses are fully uh, noted down, and the size of the boxes are shown to them and they are given to given given to them. How it works? They they select, we collect, and then we recycle. Give it for recycling. this this is the contact lens packaging that can be given to them for the recycling and that can be resent to our centers back now conclusion social responsibility is a very important to us as company and helping to protect our environment is a part of that for years contact lens wearers have struggled to find ways in which to dispose the lenses ethically without resorting to send them to landfill recycling plastic waste is high on agenda and we will be really happy if this scheme gets implemented there's a real focus on reducing the amount of plastic that is polluting our planet as this would be the first such scheme to be launched in india it is bound to have an impact on the amount of contact lens waste that is recycled these are the references thank you please keep recycling thank you dr anand uh, i think we have only 2 minutes left dr sharma you want to add anything sir mike 
Till mm. now, how many percentage of contactant users have been included in this scheme? Till now. So we started off, but uh, during COVID, that uh, the use of contact lenses also got down because everybody started. So we, it, it is a TerraCycle is a company that is used to getting this recycling done. It is, it, it is getting it done in UK as well as Australia. That is what I'm saying. We are not doing it in, in India. So we need to think about the amount of uh, amount of plastic that is going into the environment. Just we see that uh, it, a single contact lens is three grams, but the amount, the huge amount of use, usage that we that is being done. So that that leads to a lot no, number of kgs of, contact, of plastic going into the environment. I had also asked the uh, AIs to go through this and let us help in saving our environment actually, sir. Any incentive given to the person who comes down for the recycling? Uh, it is, the that, that, that company does it for free of cost, sir. TerraCycle does, does it for free of cost. Incentive to the person that is giving back the uh, lenses. The, uh, the, that uh, that box that is being given it to uh, given free to the patient sir and that is costing actually it is around uh, around 10 or 20 10 or 20 dollars actually that boxes that that they, they are they, that is taken for recycling sir okay dr sharma you want to add anything? Uh, nothing nothing for this but uh, for the overall session i'll say uh, we must uh, uh, definitely use toric lenses because this I feel is a right of the patient to use these toric lenses to get rid of the astigmatism and uh, th there is not much learning curve there and we should all do that and secondly which uh, rightly Dr. Yogesh said uh, we should not look in for the imported or Indian lenses because there are so many good lenses now in India so uh, the patient uh, somebody asked up uh, you know, for his practice, it might be about 25,000. But for our practice, we do uh, uh, patients for even 7,000 rupees with the foldable Indian lenses, hydrophobic lenses. So the patient has to get this. Uh, so these Indian lenses are making us do that, and we we are easily. Yeah, doing even it. Indian toric results are very good. Very good. In, instead of giving foreign imported non toric sometimes indian toric is much more needed this in those is, patients. this is something very good because yeah. if a patient is going for a you know a sort of a imported technician and all mm -hmm. that and it has a astigmatism yes. 1.5 go in for an indian, indian toric, toric. The, uh, the amount of the patient will be more or less the same yeah. dr sheik you want to add anything dr sajas sheik not here parvez uh, i would like to thank you first not only as a panelist you have behaved as an official photographer of the session, taking photograph. Please do share in the group. Okay, okay. Thank sure, you. Sure, sure. Thank you. And Thank if you want to add anything, anyone? No. Thank you, I think everyone. we are just in time to yes. finish the session. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, everyone.